And so far, the clocks that we look at, they were synchronous. They, they were coming from the same PLR. But uh, the case that we are going to look at right now in this video is, is a different one. So assume the two clocks that are coming uh, into your design, they're coming from two different PLRs on chip. Or maybe one coming from externally, one coming from a PLR. Right? Uh, so if, in this case, for example, just represented two PLR. This clock is divided by two version of that master clock, clock one and clock two. And eventually, something is, a data is transferred from this clock to this clock. So you can see a problem, right? Because uh, the two clocks are asynchronous means, let's say this is uh, clock one and this is clock two. Okay, uh, relative to relative to clock one, uh, previously when this edge come, this edge come, right? both were aligned edges because they were coming from the same PLR, remember? And because of the PLR circuitry, uh, the, there is a phase reduction, and if there is any phase between the edges, the phases are, are already aligned. But now these two phases are not aligned. So this clock can come like I mentioned here. Um, so this clock can really vary. It can go anywhere, right? So the two are not dependent. So, and that's the point I'm trying to make here uh, with this kind of area. I mean, it, it, it's a while, it can come anywhere. And the problem right now is when you launch a data here, okay, it may not be meeting timing here because it's very hard to predict when this clock gonna come. And the issue is when <clears throat> this launch clock, or this, let's assume this is a capture clock, this is clock two, sorry, I changed the colors. And this data is coming from this. So you are launching clock one, a data here, and it's captured by a flip-flop. Let's, let's look at the first one on a clock two. So clock two data can maybe come right at the edge there. We know that, okay, data should be stable with time before the edge, setup time, right? Uh, but this data can come here and as a result uh, when this flip-flop gets the input maybe the input didn't go all the way to vdd i mean the real case uh, is signal will vary something like this right uh, so maybe it uh, it got the data here and now the data that goes at the output here is kind of um, unstable it's not zero and it's not one or something in between and if that is kind of voltage level appears here that could be catastrophic the cool thing is about the cmos this complementary metal oxide semiconductor it has both pull up and pull logic and it um, acts a very go good noise remover it, it tries to pull things up and down to, and this thing i drew here if you remember the uh, flip-flop the latches that we talked about. Uh, you can think of them two inverters connected back to back. Once is zero, this one, one, zero, zero, one. And the, this inverter is, if you remember, this is a PMOS and NMOS. PMOS pulls to VDD, NMOS pulls to ground. So whenever <clears throat> it stays at the middle level, and there's a little bit noise from here or there, some circuit, and it just lets, that noise is enough to make it go up or down and eventually they can detect it as zero or one. And even if it's not, maybe this circuit when it goes output is able to do it. But somehow if it's not able to uh, come back to proper level for a zero or one or detectable zero and ones, uh, then what we do is on the capture side, we try to put another flap right close to it. So kind of two back-to-back -back flops, a shift register type. And the whole goal is we, we give this signal another cycle. So see, putting a flop means this signal will come here and on the next edge will come here. So we kind of delay the input signal. But the goal is in delaying it, eventually it comes out of that unstable state and either goes to zero or one. And this combination of two flip-flops and keep in mind this these both are captured on the um, these are captured on the capture clock not on this clock okay so we say okay so the information is synchronized now eventually we are kind of getting it into this clock to domain and by adding another flip flop <clears throat> we basically uh, 
increasing the probability that this signal eventually will be stable, become a zero or one. You can add another flip flop and it will increase the probability even more and more, but you are not delaying the signal. So kind of typically two flip flops back to back is a good trade off. Now important thing to keep in mind is people sometimes get confused with it that they think that, okay, this ensured that correct logic level is recovered now. This just ensured that it gets zero or one. Uh, you, the designer need to think of that. Now you're transferring between two different cloud domains and there could be problems. So in terms of taking care of this sort of cross domain uh, crossing uh, logic, the designers typically try to implement the logic transfer or <clears throat> communication in a, in a different way. Sometimes FIFOs are used. Basically you take the element of clock out and gray coding another way only one of the bits <coughs> changes sorry or you can design some sort of other handshake protocol which doesn't involve clock or involve something else that ensure that okay you are able to recover the data so and uh, these are the special these, these are not everywhere on very few places on the chip but th these are important to be checked to be verified that the intent of i mean they will not be okay i get to that in a minute first le let's look at how we treat these clocks <clears throat> generally the so this this synchronization ensured okay meta stability is taken care but generally a timing path between this and this is not a simple like a normal timing path because it's very hard whether when you assume it will come after a certain cycle, maybe on silicon doesn't come for that, right? So typically the way we handle these clocks um, is in these three ways, or maybe in two ways. One is, uh, the most uh, common one is, we define an asynchronous clock group. So we say set clock groups, asynchronous, and we put one clock, one group, one clock, two group. So the result of that is, um, you will not see a timing path between clock one and clock two. It doesn't make any sense, right, to have a timing path. So basically, you you kill that timing path. Now, the good thing about defining asynchronous is if there is a crosstalk, and crosstalk is if these two lines here, this clock one and this signal is launch capture on clock two, right, this data signal, because of the coupling capacitance, a strong uh, clock can, if this is a logic zero, it can be pulled to one, or if it's one, this downward coming can make it zero. So there could be a crosstalk glitch impact. It can also be crosstalk delay impact. A delay means if this signal was transitioning like that, and the glitch can maybe s slow it, I mean, like, the impact is that it's pulling it downside or it could be another one is going down but there is a strong pull toward the upside so it kind of delays it it, it resists to any change right sorry i didn't mean to give you a, this is very quick so think of that crosstalk impact glitch and delay impact uh, that can still be uh, considered here there's another way set false path this totally defines a false but there is no this means uh, you define it from this clock to this clock and then you also define it in the other way <clears throat> so basically you're saying there is no valid timing path the problem with this one is you will um, you will not see even the crosstalk impacts are killed set multi-cycle path now this is a safe me safe means you put a large multi-cycle. Remember multi-cycles we talk about? You put like five, six, seven cycles so that to never see a violation. But, but the thing is, there could be two problems with this. Okay, one is, that was that problem. Okay, one problem is that sometimes these clock edges can be weird. Right? But still, you need to end up a, a huge multi-cycle path for both settlement hold. So you need to maintain this one but the actually the advantage of this one is you will if if you have this set of timing paths <coughs> somewhere <coughs> i'm really sorry my throat is not helping me um so if you do a fast path or asynchronous clocks you will not see any timing path at all so 
<clears throat> sometimes we need to create a custom script to check some timing. So having an MCP sometimes can allow you that, okay, at least you can get arrival times. And uh, so, for example, in gray coding, you, you're thinking, okay, all the signals are tr getting same delay or not. What you don't want is one bit of out of eight bits is very short. Another one is very huge. So there is a window that you want all the bits to be. So those type of checks on this kind of timing, which is there between uh, two different clock domains on asynchronous side, we can take care of it with the scripting. Okay, makes sense. So asynchronous class coming in, we put synchronizer in, but designer always put a special logic in that we need to um, uh, report through a custom scripting. And typically asynchronous is done, but we can do false path, but multi-cycle if we can do it, that would be great. Okay, that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Bye.